It is not with pleasure that I report that on March 16, 2024, the Potomac Conference President, Charles Tapp, along with other conference officers, with the complicity of the Columbia Union, ordained to the Gospel Ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church female LGBT ally and advocate, Joanne Cortez. Indeed, any ordained minister employed by the North American Division present and laying hands on Sister Cortez at this service has violated their trust as an ordained minister. And it doesn't matter if they work in the NAD office, they should be dismissed from service if they can't follow what the World Church has agreed. The Church has several times voted at the highest level of global representation in general conference session not to permit the ordination of women to the gospel ministry. And yet, as of March 2024, there have been no substantive consequences for these actions. As far as we know, nothing is being done, no action is being taken to prevent these ungodly changes in faith practice. These are acts of rebellion exactly contradicting the spirit-led decisions of the global body. What else could we call them? In denomination after denomination, we've seen that theologically, women's ordination and LGBTQ advocacy go together. Uh, listen to the following excerpts drawn from just one, just one 33-minute presentation by Cortez a couple of years ago. Is this person an ally and advocate for LGBTQ? What do you think? Oh, God created each one of us with a desire to connect in order to build relationships so we can discover God, who God is through each other. You know, and each one of us, which is beautiful, is created in God's image, amen? And through each person, we get to see a glimpse of who God is. Regardless of our background, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, our gender, language, religion, beliefs, sexual orientation, geography, culture, and education, through each one, we get to see a glimpse of who God is. God intentionally made us different to reveal different aspects of God's nature so we can experience and learn to appreciate the vastness of who God is. Well, we all have biases, whether you agree or not, and many times they are implicit or unconscious biases of which we're unaware of. You know, these are thoughts that we have about age, about religion, about weight, appearance, disabilities, Accents, yeah, where's my Aussie accent, right? It's in there. <laughs> accents and gender identity, sexuality, single parents, stay-at-home moms and dads, gays, transgender people with tattoos and piercings and so much more. You know, we all have personal thoughts and inclinations regarding everything in life, which arise from our background, our experiences, from media, from privilege or cultural conditioning. So we all have biases. You know, you can also see these biases when you show favoritism, when you have a tendency to show favoritism to a certain group of people over another. And perhaps it could be because of the color of their skin, or maybe the idea that certain roles apply to a specific gender. How many times have we rejected people because of tattoos, jewelry, they were wearing jeans instead of a suit, perhaps too much makeup. They were gay, transgender, and we never really tried to get to know them or connect with them because we thought that upholding standards of perfection were more vital and supreme than making room for an individual that did not meet our expectations. <laughs> Different. Now, don't get me wrong, all right? There are some traditions that are good, but... If there is a tradition that excludes or makes someone feel out of place and not welcomed, guys, that tradition has to be set aside because people are more important. Guys, we gotta be more like Jesus and our church needs to be more like Jesus. You see, Jesus values all people, regardless of background, gender, sexuality, status, and ethnicity, so much so that he was willing to leave heaven, the comfort of heaven, and set aside tradition, right, of being king, to come to this earth in human form to die for you and me, and then rise again so everyone, all people, can have freedom and have eternal life. 
I grew up hearing that church was a place for sinners, haven't we all, right? <laughs> Yet, those who belonged to the LGBTQ plus community, well, they had to let go of their sins first before they could come to church or be a part of church. And I never really understood that, but I never really saw, thinking back, I never really saw anyone in our church who was LGBTQIA. You know, of course they weren't allowed or perhaps they had to disguise who they were, hide who they were out of fear of not belonging. Yet anytime I heard someone reference, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or queer, I could sense people getting really uncomfortable. Like if being gay is a contagious disease and we could not possibly allow these people into church. And this was sad. Years later, I, I met a gentleman who had a heart for making people smile. He was an older gentleman who wasn't married and didn't have kids. And I thought, well, maybe he just didn't find the right person, you know, timing. I don't know. But it wasn't until many months later after following me on social media and getting a glimpse of who I was through my posts and knowing I was a safe person, did he have the courage to write to me and tell me he was a transgender woman. You see, she had been born a man yet always believed she was born in the wrong body. She went to church her entire life and loved Jesus with all her heart yet could not tell anyone this secret for fear of being rejected. She had suicidal thoughts, depression, anxiety her whole life. And it wasn't until she found a loving community, not the church, <laughs> that accepted her for who she was, was she able to slowly begin to heal. And you know, she still struggles going to church because she has to cover up and hide who she is so people are not uncomfortable so people won't cast her out, mistreat her, and reject her. She still goes to church because she loves her church. She loves God, but she has to hide who she is. And this breaks my heart. Because we would rather remain comfortable with like-minded people than open our doors to allow people from all walks of life to commune with us. That's just too uncomfortable. And as a result, we have become irrelevant, stuck within the four walls of our churches, unable to connect effectively with people who are different. Because it makes us uncomfortable to sit next to someone whose sexuality is different to mine. It makes us uncomfortable to sit next to someone whose gender identity I don't understand, whose story requires me to truly listen and empathize with, and doing this could change my point of view so I'd rather be comfortable you know as a church at times we would rather work hard towards guarding our comfortable space that which we think secures our salvation rather than be the hands and feet and heart of Jesus to those in our community and as a result guys we have kept people out and God as well for too long too long we have prioritized prioritized comfortable over connection and it is time this changes number six learn how to be an ally for those who have been marginalized and advocate for them like jesus would another practical way welcome change be open to doing something different where you can meet different people and have different experiences change helps you to grow Number 10, don't limit what God can do through you and through others. Guys, God can use anyone, a woman in leadership, just like a man. So yes, empathy is important. That's why the forces opposed to God wield it so effectively against those who want to love. We want to love right, and so this is used as a weapon against us. You know, men and women are constituted emotionally differently. And I think we've just heard from somebody who's not holding the Bible line here. And is the GC complicit in this woman's ordination? Now, what substantive action have they taken in any way, I'm, I'm open, in any way, to prevent this? 
By the way, remember too that not only the general conference officers, but the North American division officers are also GC officers. If the general conference, which effectively has been granted policing responsibility on behalf of the global membership, if they refuse to hold the line, who will? If a nation refuses to police its own borders, that nation will cease to exist as a distinct people. The same is true for God's church. If we countenance the ordination of just any person to the gospel ministry, how will God bless us with depth of Bible commitment as a people? How will the church not descend into the same kind of platitudinal theology that you just heard from Cortez? A word about fallen men rather than a word about the holy God. Is the church just becoming a secular priesthood, an echo chamber for the narratives of secular ideologies? Uh, are, do we need really to copy all the other things that come down to us? Uh, why don't we copy from God's word the truths that are there? Why are we copying the work of God's enemy? The scriptures are playing upon the relations and rights of men and women. Now, I have no wish to dishearten or demoralize anyone, but I ask in earnest, when will this lethargy, this inaction, cease and godly action be taken by those in responsible positions? How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord?